Welcome everyone. I'm Jeff Lennon, Provost here at Dunwoody. And uh, welcome to our C. Charles Jackson Lecture Series. We've been doing this the first Thursday of every month for a few months now. And the topics have been on leadership. And uh, a list of the speakers, upcoming speakers, is uh, in front of you there, if you want to know who's coming up. Uh, but today, uh, I want to be able to introduce today's speaker. And um, I've got quite a few notes, and uh, as I read through them earlier, uh, I think you'll find uh, Elizabeth Abraham uh, quite interesting, actually. Uh, so it's my, my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Abraham, and Elizabeth is the majority owner and CEO and treasurer of Top Tool Company since 1991, and, and, and really a part-time basis in, from its acquisition in 1987. Uh, this has involved all aspects of the management of small business, including responsibilities of the operation, computer systems, strate strategy planning, financial administration, and human resources. Uh, Elizabeth has a background in small business consulting with an independent consulting business and with the College of St. Thomas Small Business Development Center since 1985. Uh, Prior to small business consulting, she was a senior strategic planner at First Bank Minneapolis, senior financial analyst for corporate long-range planning, and strategic development at Pillsbury Company. Elizabeth has taught marketing at St. Thomas University and small business management at the Carlson School of Management. Prior to entering the business field, Elizabeth worked in the field of mental health and education. She headed the psychology department at Fox River Hospital in Chicago, taught medical students and physicians at the Chicago Medical School and started, consulting, started a consulting service in Illinois. Uh, she contributes her skills <clears throat> as an educator, human behavior <coughs> specialist, financial strategic manager to the leadership of Top Tool Company. In addition, Elizabeth has been a member of several boards, including the advisory committee of the Machine Tool Technology Program, Minneapolis Community and Technical College, and the uh, Alumni Advisory Council at the Carlson School of Management, free to be Life Science Alley, Anoka Community College, and the Hennepin Technical College. Got about those. <laughs> <laughs> and it continues. She is a founding member of the uh, Leaders in Manufacturing Council, chair of the Minnesota Ma Manufacturing Coalition, a member of Women Presidents Organization, and a business champion for the National Business Champions Organization. Uh, Elizabeth holds a BA in psychology, an MA in social experimental psychology, and an MBA from the Carlson School of Management. And uh, something that I find a little kind of dear to my heart, she also is uh, an instrument-rated private pilot and has been known to frequently fly to Nebraska and Maine, even though she's recently given away her airplane so, <laughs> because she just wasn't flying enough. So. Um, Please welcome Elizabeth Abraham. Thank you very much for that introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, then we don't need the, that's fine. As long as I'm, if I start talking a little bit uh, lower, you can't hear me, just raise your hand. <laughs> um, so I'm really pleased to be here, and I just admire this school so much, and the students uh, who I believe get an excellent education at Dunwoody. I have attended the last two presentations here, and I just want to tell you that the, the uh, presenters just did an excellent job. They both did their homework, <laughs> they did their research, and they provided some pretty good insights to me. So I think a lot of you all know about leadership. I'm not sure I'm going to have that much to add. Um, but I can tell you my story, and I can share with you my observations in some small way, maybe that will make a difference. But before I do that, I just want to point out an article that I saw in the uh, Star Tribune on uh, July 22nd. It was a survey of um, uh, city uh, employees, including the mayor and the city council, and the results were somewhat alarming because um, it really showed you some ideas of failed leadership. And I think you can learn a lot about failed leadership just as much as you can about the success of leadership. So there are three things that uh, I wanted to point out that the, the survey reported on. And this came from the mayor as well as the city council people. The first one was um, 
The mayor is openly critical of staff, leading to a high level of distrust among employees. Another one was the inability of the council to make a decision in a timely manner. And the last one was lack of cohesive leadership from elected officials. So you can learn that's not the kind of leader you want to be. And that's not the kind of leader you want to follow. <coughs> so you can learn from this. And I, I kind of reflect on my company, Top Tool, and I'm thinking, well, how are we doing? Uh, how do we treat our employees? How are we making decisions? Is it fast enough? Are we fostering trust? And do we have a cohesive leadership? So you always can learn from mistakes. So some of my observations about leadership I want to share with you. First, leaders have vision. Um, they have timelines, and they require focus on that vision. Leaders learn from mistakes. They do not always take the safe path. Leaders develop team players. They empower others. They mentor others. They lead by example. They will not ask others to do things that they won't do themselves. They actively listen, and they surround themselves with competent people. Leaders embrace change. They take calculated risks. They do their best today, and they do better tomorrow. They do their homework, like our presenters earlier. They go out of their comfort zone, and they are positive and optimistic. Leaders have passion. They love their work, they have fun, they enjoy themselves, and I find that they volunteer at professional and trade associations. And sometimes they get involved in policy making, but most leaders always have developed a network. Leaders take care of themselves. They develop healthy habits, both physical and mental, and they spend time with their family and friends. And finally, leaders are philanthropic. They're generous with their time, their money, and their ideas. And usually there's no strings attached. So as I tell you my story, um, maybe think of some of these traits, and I'll point them out along the way. So I was born into an Irish, German, lower middle class family in New England. My mother was a very bright Irish immigrant. And my father was a very bright Irish, German, alcoholic entrepreneur. <laughs> I was the youngest of four children. And uh, when I was in high school, my parents decided to get a divorce. Now back in the 60s, that was not um, really accepted very well. It was kind of frowned upon. Um, so my father lost his driver's license, and I became his driver until I could no longer stay up late at night to pick him up at bars. So he disowned me. It was an unhappy childhood, and I wanted to get out of my family as soon as I could. I went to college, uh, um, so I went to college 600 miles away, and there I felt safe. Uh, I, uh, the craziness of my family was far away. The opportunities to explore different ways of living different roles to start and to uh, start to learn who I was and what my skills were I accomplished in my, in my years at college. And I expect the students of Dunwoody are going through something similar for themselves. In a strange way, my unhappy childhood made me understand how important family can be. It has become one of my strongest values in both my personal and my professional life. Family comes first at Top Tool. Needless to say, at this point in my life, I had no idea I would become the CEO of a high-tech manufacturing company. In high school, and then later in college, I was drawn into leadership roles. In high school, I started a club to help raise funds for gifts at Christmas time to nursing home residents. But what amazed me most was about the amount of complaining people would do and they wouldn't do anything about it. So it was a lot easier for me to organize, take action, and get people to help support me and others to make a change. In college, I found the faculty had a profound impact on me. By their influence, I learned to do my best today and better tomorrow. 
Being stagnant was not an option. So I had to make, I had to accept the failures that I made. But I had the view that I would learn from those failures and tomorrow I would be better. It was an optimistic view that I still have today. And I believe most leaders are optimistic and positive. I learned to believe in myself and I strive to make a difference. <coughs> and a note to the faculty that are here might see this later. You do make a difference beyond your lifetime when you mentor your students. It is a legacy for you, so keep it up. I graduated from college during the recession of 1968, and it was really hard to find a job, so I did what other bright graduates uh, and my classmates did. I went to graduate school, <laughs> <laughs> and I got a degree in experimental social psychology. My thesis leader was a wonderful mentor. Dr. Paul Wright made sure that I was on the path to graduate. So it took a while to find a job in my area of expertise in Chicago. I had a vision I wanted to be a psychologist. I wanted to help people. In 1972, I did become a psychologist in a psychiatric and rehabilitation hospital, which was connected to Chicago Medical School, where I taught medical students. I learned a lot from my patients, to actively listen, to empathize, to never give up. I began to appreciate the diversity of people and their strength and the power of a collection of a, of a um, diverse group of people. There is rarely only one way to solve a problem. There were times when I felt completely out of my comfort zone, but I didn't give up. Instead, I found other experts who would help me. In a short time, I became department head, and I hired people who had better skills in areas where I was weak. I hired consultants to continue my training, and then I started a private practice in Evanston, which is a suburb north of <coughs> Chicago. I became involved with, the, uh, involved with the Illinois Psychological Association, and I co-authored papers in the psychology field. I worked very hard. I did my best every day. And I loved my work and those people with whom I worked. I was having fun. These are examples of some of the traits I mentioned earlier. Leaders surround themselves with competent people and they are positive and they actively listen. In 1977, I moved to Minneapolis with my husband, Al. And I worked as a family therapist and group <coughs> therapist. When the insurance companies started to intrude on the <coughs> therapy of my patients in the late 70s, I became very frustrated and I decided to leave the field. I earned an MBA from the Carlson School at the University of Minnesota. And this was a great experience. I was a little older now. I had some you know, career experience under my belt. And I was enjoying myself as long as I was, and still learning. I became president of the Student MBA Council and the Alumni, the alumni Advisory Board. I worked as a TA, and I enjoyed my colleagues and the faculty, and many, many other faculty. I learned and I had fun. These are examples of embracing change as I shifted from my career from psychology to business. After I graduated, I worked in several large corporations. I really did not like this career path. It was an effort to go to work. It wasn't fun, and I had no passion for the work I was doing. So I left to work in a small business for a while and did some consulting. So you can see how important the passion and having fun was to me in this part of my career. <coughs> Meanwhile, my husband, who was becoming, who had, after becoming a partner in a large international CPA firm, decided he wanted to change his career as well. Together, we purchased a tool and die company in Fridley called Top Tool. This was Al's company. I knew nada about tool and die. <laughs> <laughs> However, I did have a half a course at the Carlson School in IT. So, I became the IT person to help install the system in 1989. Soon, I was doing office and clerical work full time. A psychologist with an MBA in finance doing clerical work 
does not seem a, like a likely path to becoming a leader in the manufacturing, manufacturing industry. <coughs> Next, I want to talk about building a team. It takes time. I learned about our company and the skills necessary to become a tool maker. I listened to the tool makers. I heard the problems of the supervisors. There was a, cu a culture in the top tool company initially where the employees really feared their bosses. You know, I'd go into the room and they'd stop talking. It was like, what happened? <laughs> so Al and I needed to decide, decided that we needed to change the culture from a top-down military style to more of a team-building approach where everybody's ideas were welcomed. This was not short-term, nor was it easy. People don't automatically trust us just because we were the boss. We needed to earn their trust. And we earned it over time, through our actions, and we also led by example. Now, there's an approach in psychology about learning uh, where you learn the most after you make a mistake. So I studied rats, lab rats, <laughs> you know, in a maze. And we put the rat in the maze and, uh, and a piece of cheese over there and the rat would run right to the cheese. But how do we know that the rat learned the pathway? Well, you really don't. So then we started putting barriers in the maze. We put the rat in and <laughs> the rat would try to find the piece of cheese and couldn't find it and it failed. Somewhere, ended up somewhere in the corner. That was at first. But then after a few more trials, the rat learned to overcome the barriers and reach the goal. We felt the rat learned after making at least one failed attempt. Now, I'm not saying toolmakers are rats. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted our toolmakers to try new things without fear of failing. We wanted them to come up with ideas and push the envelope. So we started to talk to them about how they go about doing something. Then we were telling them that failure was not an immediate pathway to being fired like it used to be. As long as they learned from their mistakes, we would continue to invest in them. For the most part, over time, this worked. And conversations uh, would spark new ideas. People finally started coming to Al with new ideas. Some worked, some didn't. One, one day, we found a die plate in the trash. With our foreman, we identified the toolmaker, and we asked him what happened. He had made a mistake, and he tried to hide it. Well, he wasn't the brightest light bulb in our tool room, <laughs> trying to hide the die plate in our um, recycled uh, um, bin, scrap barrel. But this gave us an opportunity to teach him and to show his other colleagues that how important it was to own up to his own mistake and learn from it. <clears throat> so we were on our way to changing the culture and developing teamwork, which was very important to us and to the success of Top Tool. We had no sales force. We grew by our pristine reputation and referrals. One day, in one of our off-site strategy meetings, we decided to explore expanding <coughs> into production the production side of the business. It was risky, but we decided to embrace the change. Many of our customers were stampers, right? So it was kind of logical next step for us. We made dies for our customers, they put them in their presses, and they made the parts. So we decided we would do that. We moved into a larger building, we bought some top of the line presses, we hired some people with um, stamping experience, we developed some marketing materials, and then we waited for the phone to ring, just like it did when we were a tool and die company. Well, you know what happened, right? We made a big mistake. But did we learn from it? We knew we needed a sales team, but we really had a difficult time getting the right fit. We hired sales reps who did nothing for us. <laughs> you know, we're probably at the bottom of their list. Then we hired internal salespeople some of them would go out and bring back something that we could maybe uh, quote, but it didn't, fit our, it didn't fit our core business at all. Some of them would sit in the office day after day and on the phone. They would never go out <laughs> and uh, look for business. 
So Al and I looked at each other and we said, you know what? We're probably the best sales team we could be. So we started to get into sales. Neither one of us were that comfortable doing it. Um, we had a sales firm in Texas uh, who worked with small companies like ours, and we connected well with them. Al worked with these companies in Texas, and our stampings grew. And there was a major medical company in the Twin Cities that we built a lot of dyes for over the past when we were just a tool and dye shop. So I started working with them on, spring, on stampings. I worked with the buyers on the sales part, and then when it came to the technical side of it, I brought some of my technical people with me, and they were discussing engineers. I knew my limitations and my strengths, and I supplemented my sales calls with competent technical people. We became a really great team. These are examples of learning from my mistakes in building a sales team. So after a while, we had a team-based culture, a small production department, along with a great wire EDM department, and a high-tech tool room. We had a growing medical customer base, and we had other customers in defense, <coughs> electronics, consumer, and aerospace industry. We began to branch out in other areas in the manufacturing industry. When Governor Palente started his first trade mission to Montreal, Top Tool joined the group. And then PBS Almanac came in and covered us as one of the companies making the trip. Now, I was really nervous about going alone, but our budget could only afford one. So I was surprised the first night in Montreal at a dinner when my fellow trip companions and my colleagues acknowledged my performance on Al Almanac. <laughs> you know, they liked the attention manufacturing was getting, giving, getting. After that experience, I knew I loved talking about manufacturing and the great industry in Minnesota. My enthusiasm and my passion was obvious, and I was asked to become a business champion for the Precision Manufacturing Association, which is um, a national trade association. So I traveled around the, company, the country promoting manufacturing careers. These are examples of the risks, working out of my comfort zone, and a passion which drives behavior. Being a woman CEO in manufacturing is somewhat isolated. It helps, you know, to share the burdens and the risks, the joys and the accomplishments with others. I was very lucky to have met several women in the precision manufacturing industry who also felt a need for comradeship. Together, we formed the Women Leaders in Manufacturing Council, which we met monthly at each other's companies. <coughs> this was a godsend. We didn't have to over-explain ourselves. We shared ideas stories, sources for funding, uh, and even backup roles in case of disaster. It was through this group that I learned about a grant that we could use for intangibles like marketing and software. As a group, we made a difference to each other, and we supported each other in our growth, both personal and professional. This is an example of the networking that I talked about earlier. and tragedy struck in 2007. While driving back from Nebraska in June uh, from a family reunion, an 18-wheeler struck my car and pushed us into oncoming traffic. My husband's life was saved by the jaws of life and an expert medical team at HCMC. He came home in October of that year after a long four-month rehabilitation, and a longer recovery during the next year. This is the test of many things. Do I have a team in place to run the company in case of disaster? Does our culture allow for leadership from our team? Are Al's and my health in good enough shape to recover from this horrible accident? Well, it couldn't have been better. That day in June, when I was driving home, my vice president of operations was going to Hawaii on vacation. He got the call at the airport. Great vacation for him, right? He commandeered his son's computer and ran the company from overseas. It was just amazing. 
everyone at Top Tool stepped up to the plate and did more than their fair share. That year, we doubled sales and increased profits. I couldn't have been more proud. People came out of the network, out of the woodwork, to support me, Al, and our company. My hospital room looked like a funeral parlor with all the flowers and good wishes, even from competitors and former employees. Our bank, Wells Fargo, was very supportive and waited for months to get our financial statements. So there's a silver lining in most tragedies. Both Al and I recovered, and Top Tool continued to grow. And to this day, we have great employees and leaders at Top Tool. But now came a transition phase. With that brush of death and the age we were, to, in our mid to late 60s, we realized we needed to make a change in our personal lives. All the time Al was in the hospital, I would be with him every day and whisper in his ear, although he was unconscious, who knows if he heard me, Al, you are strong. You grew up on a farm. You served our country in the Navy. You are going to make it. And you will never work 80 hours a week again. <laughs> it's true. Abe got that mentoring advice from me for three straight months until he became conscious and on his way to recovery. Well, probably not mentoring, more like brainwashing. <laughs> Al never worked more than 40 hours again at Top Tool. So, do you think the CIA might be interested in hiring me? <laughs> How do you replace a president, an active president, who, who was a CPA, a former tax accountant who did sales, engineering, quoting, and all the financial work. It took a long while, and a lot of good people from our office assistants to top management, and a few bumps along the way. I realized I needed help. Now, I read an article in Inc. Magazine about an owner who had trouble stepping down from operations, so he started a board of advisors. Now was the right time for us to start one. I met with the author who gave me some very good advice about what worked for him and some mistakes that he made. So I reached out to my network of professional colleagues. Who do I need? As Al was recovering, I identified positions I felt could most benefit from some advice. Accounting, especially someone that was in a, a company that was small that grew to a larger company. Marketing or public relations. Um, quality with some experience in manufacturing. Human resource. And an overall manufacturing guru who was well connected with our community. How lucky I was to find these highly competent people willing to serve on our board of advisors. Their advice, uh, over, oh, over the years, uh, some of the people have retired, but three of the five people are still on our board. And their advice and mentoring have been invaluable. They are all leaders in the field. This is an example of the generosity of leaders to give their time and ideas. It is also another example of surrounding ourselves with competent people. One observation I, uh, I mentioned earlier was taking care of oneself, both mentally and physically. This is more important than you think. Working 80 hours a week is not taking good care of yourself. And once that trend was broken, it was easier to change and do a better job. Leaders are physically active throughout their life. Right now, I walk, I play golf, I bike. Oh, I don't count my golf stores, by the way. I don't <laughs> know how my stores are. Um, I do Pilates, I travel. And I make sure I go to my annual physicals, both for my eyes, my teeth, my skin, to make sure that I'm on the right track and I'm healthy. This is kind of preventive care. On the more passive but intellectually stimulating side, I read a lot for pleasure, not work-related. I attend concerts and plays. Live performance thrills me more than film. I love to eat and drink good food and good wine. <laughs> I used to be on the board of directors of a wine distribution company. 
I got paid in wine. <laughs> Not in the beginning, you know, they couldn't do that, but then later when they, they were successful. And although it is diminishing, I keep up my friendship. I have a nice, really nice wine cellar, although it's diminishing. Um, I do pull the wine every now and then. I keep up my, with my friendships, with those I enjoy, and I end those that are harmful to me, or just maybe we grow apart. Another hobby that was mentioned earlier that kept me fit was one of the main loves of my life, flying a small single engine plane, and eventually a mooning. This hobby helped me to expand my horizons. It challenged me mentally and helped me to get to places fast. I found solitude and peace in the air where I had control of everything but the weather and I could do, rely solely on myself. I could foc I focused, I had checklists, which I always used. I planned trips and backgrounds and backups in case of emergencies. This is the one area where I am kind of a loner. I usually fly by myself, unless I'm going to Nebraska, then Al flies with me. I love it. I have a passion for flying. My license plate says love to fly, <laughs> <laughs> and it still does, even though I don't have the plane. Um, but since the car accident in 2007, I had very little time to fly the hours I needed to feel safe and confident. So last year I donated my plane to the Wings of Hope, an international organization which uh, provides free service to children who are ill, and, they, and uh, they get them to new medical care. All their services are free, including flying to hospitals like the Mayo Clinic. So it was a gift, and I'm very happy to know that my plane is being used to help others in need. Many leaders give to others. I do not know where I would have been in my career without my education and those who gave to me. So I do donate for scholarships, fellowships, and other programs in the three colleges I attended. I sit on boards and give my time and thoughts, whatever that's worth. I feel it's important to give back and to pass it on. Some leaders also help others in, in need, maybe people that they knew in the past who are now struggling. A few more ideas before I end. I admire Warren Buffett and his words of wisdom. Not only because he's from Nebraska, <laughs> as Al is, but also he has values similar to mine. In an article in June online, there were 14 tips that Warren <coughs> advised his students. One of them I wished I, someone had advised me when I was younger. Break bad habits when you are young. So now I'm talking to the students, because <laughs> all of us are beyond that, I think. <laughs> So he states that when you are young, it is relatively easy to improve or change the poor habits that you have compared to people his age, and I think is around my age. So when I was young, I thought bad habits would go away mysteriously when I became an adult. Well, now I know better. <laughs> I think I've touched on the observations of leadership I discussed in the beginning. Leaders have vision, they learn from their mistakes, they develop team players, they embrace change, they take care of themselves, and they are generous. I'm 69 years old. I have a lot more living and learning to do. When I graduated from Lake Erie College in 1968, I had no idea I would be the CEO of an award-winning company. I am pleased with my career paths, which led me to this place. And I'm pleased to be presenting some ideas about leadership to you and to the students of Dunwoody. Maybe it will make a small difference. Dunwoody is a great college with promising students, and you have been a very gracious audience. <laughs>